Good afternoon. I'm Professor John Jackson, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our guest speaker today. While I don't want to take too much time away from him, I have been asked to take a few minutes to provide a little information about the events leading up to the capture of Porter Haile Burton, to speak briefly about the treatment of POWs in general during the Vietnam War, and then I'll turn the microphone over to a man I greatly admire. First, I ask each of you to think back to where you were and what you were doing on January 6, 2006. Let me spark a few memories. The last remake of King Kong starring Jack Black and Adrian Brody was in the theaters, as was Brokeback Mountain, a rather unusual Western that went on to receive eight Academy Award nominations. <laughs> the TV show Lost was in its second season, and Super Bowl XL was on the horizon, which would pit the Pittsburgh Steelers against the Seattle Seahawks. Nobody cared then either. So. <laughs> January 6th of 2006 is exactly 2,675 days ago, which is the period of time that Porter spent in the prisons of North Vietnam. Seven years, three months, and 26 days. It's been almost five decades since Lieutenant Junior Grade Porter Halliburton and his pilot, Lieutenant Commander Stan Olmsted, climbed into their F-4B Phantom fighter bomber and launched on a mission over North Vietnam. This was Porter's 75th combat mission of the war, and it would prove to be his last. During a low altitude run 40 miles north of Hanoi, the plane encountered heavy ground fire and took a direct hit in the cockpit from a 37 millimeter anti-aircraft shell. Recognizing that the plane was, had been critically damaged and the pilot killed, Porter ejected from the stricken aircraft. He was soon captured by Vietnamese villagers and at the age of 24 became the 40th American prisoner to be taken in North Vietnam. To help visualize the events and the conditions which followed, we will display a series of drawings done by Lieutenant Commander Mike McGrath, who himself spent six years as a POW in North Vietnam. I think we'll do that. There we go. Uh, his book, Prisoner of War, was originally published in 1975 by the U.S. Naval Institute. Once Porter ejected from his stricken aircraft, he was quickly captured by local peasants and militia. Within days, he had been transported to the Wa Lo prison. Okay, guys, you run it. My button's not working so good. Which ultimately came to be known as Hanoi Hilton. Thus began his seven-and-a-half-year ordeal. Mike McGrath drew pictures of their accommodations, but more revealing is this photo of the actual cell in which he was held. The prisoners were kept in such austere conditions, often shackled in leg irons and handcuffs for weeks and months at a time. When not, not, when not locked down, they were subjected to brutal treatment from abusive guards who took great pleasure in their suffering. Most vicious of all were the professional interrogators who were given pet names by the prisoners. With complete disregard for the Geneva Convention, these interrogators used various forms of punishment and physical torture to force information and statements from the POW. Many were forced to kneel on rocks and other sharp objects for hours or even days on end. By far the most common method of torture was what the POWs came to call the rope trick. They were tightly bound in painful positions which often pulled arms out of sockets and left many permanent injuries. Punishment was routinely given for violation of camp rules. This punishment included beatings with rubber straps and countless hours in painful shackles. Communication of any kind between prisoners was forbidden, but the resourceful POWs maintained contact with one another by various methods, including written notes on scraps of stolen paper, the now famous POW devised tap code, and the POW mute code, which was used when visual contact could be made. From 1964 to 1969, most prisoners were kept in solitary confinement or in very small groups. But several events, including the attempted rescue raid on the Sante prison, caused a significant improvement in their treatment. 
Over time, increasing pressure to improve conditions was brought to bear by the U.S. government, as well as by individuals such as Ross Perot and other organizations. The most effective of these organizations was the National League of Families of POWs and MIAs in Southeast Asia, which was founded by Sybil Stockdale, the wife of former Naval War College President James Bond Stockdale. Porter's wife, Marty, was very active in the National League as the coordinator for the 10 southern states. Public support was shown in many ways, and many in this audience may have worn POW bracelets, such as this one, engraved Lieutenant Commander Porter Halliburton, 10-17-65. From 1970 on, most prisoners were held in large cells in the Hanoi Hilton, each holding up to 40 prisoners. Their conditions were still meager and crowded, but far better than before. After 10 years of war and nearly five years of negotiations, the Paris Peace Accords were signed in January of 1973, and the POWs began to be released in February. Shown here is Lieutenant Commander Halliburton about to board the C-141 in Hanoi, finally on his way to freedom. The remarkable story of Porter and Air Force POW Fred Cherry was told in the book, Two Souls Indivisible, the friendship that saved two POWs in Vietnam, which is now part of the Chief of Naval Operations professional reading program. Dr. Halliburton served as a professor here at the Naval War College from 1979 until his retirement in 2006. He now holds Professor Emeritus status. Please welcome Commander Porter Halliburton back to Spruance Auditorium. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as Mark Twain said, the reports of my death were greatly exaggerated. Um, I think the Navy actually tried to get rid of me. Um, so I got back at them by spending over 25 years here. And here I am again. Well, um, about the drawings and so on that you saw, um, of course, brutality was one of the central features of our experience, uh, as was boredom in between. Uh, but I don't want to talk about that. I really want to talk about how we responded to these two things, which were so central. And I think it's always important to talk about what you learn from an experience rather than the experience itself. So that's what I want to do um, this afternoon. Um, I want to break it down into groups of three. Um, just for convenience, there were three time periods that I can identify that were important. There were three uh, adaptations to changing conditions. Uh, there were three reflections that I might make about that experience and then three lessons or important things that I would draw from my experience there. So I want to start with um, sort of the chronological ones, the three time periods. And the first one was from um, Everett Alvarez's first experience in 1964 um, up through the summer of 1966. And this, I think, was a period in which um, we as prisoners and um, Vietnamese as captors were trying to figure out one another. We were trying to figure out how do we survive in this kind of condition and how do we obey the code of conduct and how do we take care of one another and how do we communicate with one another because we were forbidden to communicate with one another. And we knew that that was essential to leadership and command and morale and everything else. And so during this time was when our our greatest leaders emerged. We had, a, we had a saying, you had to get there early to get the good deals. And uh, it was a little difficult figuring out what those good deals were sometimes. But one of them was that people like Jim Stockdale and Jerry Denton and Robbie Reisner and others, senior officers, got there early. Reisner and Stockdale uh, were both shot down about a month before I was. And these outstanding, amazing individuals were able to look at this situation, to sum it up based on a lot more experience and wisdom 
in education than JOs like me had at the time. And it was the establishment of that leadership in the very beginning and um, guidance about how do, we, how do we live up to the code of conduct, at least in spirit. How do we deal with these situations? How do we communicate with one another? How do we organize for resistance? And the Vietnamese are trying to figure out Americans, uh, what, what makes them tick and so on, and to extract as much information as they could, which could be used for propaganda, because we quickly realized that that was, that was the deal, was propaganda. They wanted us for propaganda and perhaps as bargaining chips at the end of the war whenever that might be. And of course, we thought the war was going to be over very quickly. Um, the most pessimistic among us during this time thought it would last for two years. Uh, the most optimistic were thinking like next week. Um, and of course, we were both wrong. Uh, and so this period was one of adaptation, organization, and uh, um, learning uh, how to survive in this kind of environment. Well, in the summer of 1966, uh, we bombed within the confines of Hanoi for the first time. And the Vietnamese, in their frustration, uh, decided to make a spectacle out of us uh, captured who have done this. And so uh, they organized this Hanoi March, which some of you have read about or knew about in which about 60 of us were marched down the streets of Hanoi and uh, subjected to a gauntlet of everything you can imagine. And it was one of the very, very, very few times that I thought I would lose my life. Uh, it was that bad. Their plans were to put us on trial for war crimes as a, as a propaganda thing. Um, President Johnson did say, if you do, we're gonna level Hanoi with B-52s. And so they kind of backed off on that a little bit. But they did uh, pursue a change in policy. And up to this time, treatment had been brutal, but torture was not really used uh, on a regular basis. And after this time, the rules changed, the policy changed, and torture was used to get what they had not been able to get by coercion and, and other forms of mis mistreatment and beatings and so on. And so this began a new way of life. And this is the point at which Fred Cherry and I were separated and we both went back into solitary confinement and I moved out to a really bad place in the country. And so this period lasted from 1965 until the end of 1969 and it was the longest period and the most difficult. And during that period uh, we had to devise new things, second line of resistance, and how do we deal with being broken? Because the uh, first time we were tortured, most of us did not think we could be broken. We had been taught that we could not be broken and we'd, we would sacrifice our lives rather than giving in. And so the fact that um, this death was not an option changed everything. Uh, continued suffering over an indeterminate period of time was the choice, and so we had to learn how to, how to deal with that. And uh, during, um, during the first period, though, they used all kinds of techniques, sort of experimenting with different things, and I think I was one of the experiments. Uh, I was moved from the Hanoi Hilton to another place after being told that um, you can um, move to a better place. All you have to do is talk to us and answer the questions and we'll move you to a better place. You'll be with your friends and all of that and have a great time. And, or if you don't, then you will move to a worse place. And I moved to a worse place and, and it was worse than the Hanoi Hilton. You saw a picture of the Hanoi Hilton. Um, Heartbreak Hotel, we called it. And about every two weeks or 10 days, um, I was presented with this ultimatum again, better place or worse place, you make a choice. And each time they had a worse place. And this happened two or three times and uh, I wound up in a coal storage bin out at the back wall of a prison we call the zoo. 
And by this time, I had lost a lot of weight. I had dysentery, I think. Um, I couldn't eat anything, and uh, I was in some despair. My health was failing. My mental ability was failing. My will to resist was failing. Uh, I was being ground down. I didn't see how I could possibly survive this place any, anymore. And so I was presented with this um, choice once again, a better place or a worse place. And um, the better place sounded pretty good <laughs> right then. But I, with a lot of prayer and the realization that I was making a very important choice, I, I chose not to. And uh, their thought of the worst place, as some of you know, was to move in with a, with a black Air Force officer who was senior to me by two grades, um, who had a lot more experience than I did. They thought that moving a young southern white boy in with a black was going to be the last straw, the worst place. And of course, he was very badly injured, and I was ordered to take care of him. They thought this was going to break both of us down. Well, it didn't. It was the best thing that could have happened to me because moving in with Fred Cherry changed my life. Uh, it turned my concerns away from my own to somebody else's to try and help him survive and save his life. And he credits me with saving his life, but he certainly saved mine in, in his his whole demeanor, his whole attitude, his patriotism, in spite of uh, racial prejudice and discrimination and everything else. And uh, we became uh, fast friends. Actually, the only problem we had was this Air Force thing. <laughs> um, but we managed to get through that. And I did, I remember talking to him one time about being shot down in conditions. And I said, uh, well, I guess my radio didn't work because nobody answered me. You know, we had one of these big bulky things with the battery on it connected with a cord. And um, nobody answered me when I got on the radio. And, and obviously, in retrospect, none of my beepers or anything worked because nobody knew that I was shot down and later declared killed in action. Well, I discovered that, you know, and the reason was we had one had less than one radio per aviator, and you had to uh, draw them out of a pool. And of course, MCON conditions on the carrier, you couldn't test it, so it didn't work. Fred Cherry, Air Force Major, had five radios, <laughs> three of them <laughs> voice capable. So right away, you know, uh, <laughs> I said, there is a difference between the Navy and the Air Force here. I learned a lot about the Air Force. Um, however, this next period, though, Fred and I were separated and conditions got worse for, for both of us, uh, for everyone, and torture was used, uh, as you saw, uh, in a systematic way to get what, uh, what they couldn't get otherwise. And so this was a terrible time, but it all brought us together. Common suffering brings people together as long as they have a common goal. Uh, and realize that they are all in it together. And I think that's what, that's what happened during this time. Well, at the end of it, Ho Chi Minh died um, late 69, and uh, they took that opportunity to sort of change their treatment because, it, frankly, it wasn't working. They had been able to extract uh, statements and make videos and so on of, of people talking about things and so on, but... Um, they just, they didn't quite understand American culture well enough to, to notice the clues that were being sent, you know, when people were uh, being photographed. So this was an example of, of um, and sometimes there were two, um, uh, an example of how we could fight back, uh, simply because the Vietnamese had no one who was educated in the United States. Uh, they didn't, most of them, speak English very well, and, if it was, and it was not American English. So they didn't understand American humor, or culture, or history very well. And so you could, in either written form or photographically or any other way, 
um, put bombs in there that the ordinary viewer back here, which they were trying to influence, uh, would see was, was put up. You know, one of the most famous was, of course, Jerry Denton, who was tortured uh, horribly to agree to make a statement in front of a group. And of course, he, he was trying to look as confused and as, as, as beat up as possible, which was not hard, but he was blinking his eyes. And as you know, he was sending Morse code, blinking out the word torture. And actually, this was the first communication from Hanoi to Washington that we were being tortured. And so it was not only to uh, sort of negate the value of this sort of statement, but it was to, uh, to convey some intelligence. And so it was these kinds of things. And during this time, Stockdale, Denton, Reisner, many others um, sort of set the bar for our our conduct. It wasn't that they were telling us what to do or not to do so much as they were demonstrating what to do and what not to do uh, by, and of course Stockdale uh, got the uh, Medal of Honor, which was uh, greatly deserved for his willingness. But there were so many other acts uh, that, um, that, that were so inspirational uh, and so we did emerge from this, finally, after Ho Chi Minh conveniently died and they reassessed their program. And it hadn't been very successful. And Sybil Stockdale is back here, Ross Perot is back here, raising awareness about the way we were being treated. And he's flying plane loads of Christmas presents and journalists and so on. Um, not that they ever were successful in uh, landing there, but, um, and so I think they realized that um, their cultivation of the anti-war movement, which was their objective, uh, was in danger of being split over the issue of our treatment. And so they, they decided to change that. And plus they had, they, somebody finally pointed out, you know, some of these obvious things and, and they realized that we were continuing to resist uh, almost everyone and uh, that they were not getting what they wanted. And so they thought, well, they better change it. So anyway, they changed their treatment. Uh, we moved into bigger groups. We began getting letters, packages from home. Um, uh, my wife and I corresponded by letter for the first time after five years. Um, in the packages were vitamin pills and some other supplements and so on. The food got better. We got more time outside our treatment improved a great deal, thanks to um, those who wore bracelets and sent letters and prayed and all of that it really had an effect. Um, so um, in this kind of new environment, we were able to do a lot of things we hadn't been able to do before, some rather serious academic um, endeavors, um, physical, we were in better shape, uh, spiritual, uh, and so on, and so we were pretty active, and you had more people, you had resources, and so on, and so we had things like contests for um, push-ups and deep knee bends and pull-ups and things like that, which, and I was never good at uh, push-ups or pull-ups, but I did do deep knee bends, and to give you an example, um, my competitor would do 500, and I'd do 1,000, and then he would do 2,000 and I would do three. And he did four and I did five. And then finally we got to this level. It would take literally all night. You had to do these things. You're going, you can't stop. You need to go up and down. And um, he did, um, did 7,000. And I would have challenged him for 10 but you couldn't do more than 7,000 in the period of time from the time the door closed in the evening till it opened in the morning. So I let him have it. <laughs> Thank God I did. My knees are shot, you know. <laughs> so anyway, but it was, it was fun. We, uh, we, we learned to, to tell movies. Uh, we always had an education and entertainment officer and 
somebody would be assigned to tell a movie every night or there'd be poker games or whatever. And so we revived the art of storytelling because sometimes the only thing you could remember about a movie was, was the title, maybe even not that, but one or two, um, one or two uh, characters or something and you had to build two hours of entertainment around that. Um, I also, um, I learned, uh, I was always interested in languages, never very good at it, but, um, but I wanted to learn German. And so in this environment, I was able to live with some folks who knew German pretty well and uh, it learned en enough that I was conducting a little introductory class to some other folks and everything. And so uh, German was, uh, was fun. And uh, after I came back, I, I wanted to go back to graduate school. And so I, I, I entered into uh, undergraduate some undergraduate courses to get back in the swing. And I talked to my advisor and I said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to take German. I, I told him my experience with it and everything. And he said, why don't you take the equivalency test? And I did, I passed first year college German based on, on my um, experience in Hanoi. Because we didn't have a dictionary and, and uh, any written stuff was temporary and it, we reverted to its original purpose, which is toilet paper. And um, so we didn't have uh, a good resource, but um, if we didn't know a German word that we needed, we just made one up. You know, and German is wonderful because of the construction of words and so on. So a, a rabbit became a hip and hopper. <laughs> and, a, and, and a duck was a swimming quacking. And, and so these, you know, we had these words. So I was, Taking German too in, <laughs> in school, and uh, we all speaking German, and every now and then one of these Hanoi words would kind of hop out, if you will, and people were wondering, what the hell was that, you know? <laughs> so I'd have to explain that uh, I had these words so ingrained <laughs> that, that, that they just happened. But it was, you know, it's just an example. People did all kinds of things that were amazing. Uh, just because we, uh, we determined to stay busy. Well, uh, there were also three adaptations in my own personal experience to this, these times, and they don't really co coincide with the, the three time periods, but somewhat. And, uh, and the, f the first, um, I would call retrospection, because um, there was so little to do that I spent most of my time thinking about the past because the past was, was enjoyable. That's where my friends and family were and that's where my good memories were. And so if I could live in the past, then um, I could avoid the, the, the present. And a lot of times in an interrogation, which these were more indoctrination, sometimes in interrogation, the, um, the, in, the interrogator would be lecturing me on something, you know, and I found out if you just kind of nodded your head about every five minutes, you know, he thought you were there, but I was not. I was back in North Carolina, you know, and, and doing, doing things. I wasn't listening at all. And uh, so, you know, my life was really a, a reliving of my, of my past. And it, in the process, I, I relived a lot of good memories, but I also realized some of the stupid things I had done, some of the bad things I had done, the wasted time that I had wasted all over uh, during this time, and it was painful. And I began to think, well, how, how am I ever gonna make up for this, this lost time and these lost opportunities and the waste that had occurred? And so I began to think about, well, what's the future going to be like? And so this next period, uh, I would call dreams and plans. And I began to think about the future, how I was going to rectify some of these things, how I was going to lead a different life, what life would be like. And uh, I began to think about everything I was interested in, everything that I thought was important. And I eventually had to make a list to keep track of these because everybody, every time I'd meet a new person that we'd talk about things, there would be new information. So I had a list of 77 different categories of interest. And I could go through these things alphabetically and stop on one and pull that mental folder out and look at the information and, and revise it or think about it and stick it back in there and move on. 
there's art, aviation, automobiles, and it just went on uh, right through, through the alphabet. And so um, I was really living in the future in order to escape from a very painful present. Well, at some time, and this was a gradual time, I think, I began to live in the present because by now, things had gotten better. We had adjusted uh, to our conditions. We, um, for many of us, the time of torture was over. We did not have to deal with that constant threat. Um, and so we found um, that the present in our adjustment to it was okay. That we could lead meaningful lives through our activities and through each other as family. And all of these guys became family, even though I knew it lived with a very small percentage of them. But every time you moved in with somebody new, you went through the list and we all memorized lists of who was there. And uh, I had a list of 350 names memorized alphabetically, chronologically by shoot down, by airplane type, by rank and service, physical location if we knew it. Go through those lists every day, every day. And so in, the, in, in collecting information about these people and hearing stories about them, uh, they became real people that were part of our, of our family. And so we were not just an organization. Uh, we became a family. And uh, I think we found that, uh, as Viktor Frankl says, that you can find meaning in the very worst of circumstances. And sometimes that's where you really discover it. Because suffering is the most powerful way of discovering the meaning in your life. And I'm not talking about the big meaning in life. I'm talking about everyday life, what you do every day. And so I think that we realized um, that we realized that we had, we had a meaningful life. I wonder, I, one of the things I did to stay busy, I was an English major in college. And, so um, was to write stories and songs and poetry. And uh, the first po poem that I wrote, I want to read it to you, and it was during the early, the early times, called um, Winter Crypt. How can I describe the way that I feel? As if the stream I was crossing had suddenly frozen and locked my ankles in an icy grip, immobilizing that once fluid force and die with it. And we have nothing to do but wait until the thaw. And of course, as I hope you understand, we've figured out that we had a lot more to do than simply wait and that it was gonna be a long time. Vietnamese were fond of telling us this war is gonna last five, 10, 20 years or longer. And of course we dismissed that as just an attempt to um, make us depressed. Well, after I'd been there for five years, I figured maybe they had something there. <laughs> and so we began to, 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 to take note of that and I guess to, to figure out, okay, if this lasts 20 years or longer, what's our lives gonna be like here? And so I think we began to realize that what we had was an American culture, not just an organization, but a culture. And we had every aspect of culture except for the obvious of our, of our real families. And so um, I think that at the end, when I was first shot down, I was thinking, I was shot down in October, I was hoping to be out by Christmas because I just couldn't imagine being there for Christmas. And then it was, Summer, I couldn't imagine being there for summer, and yet we were, and time after time. Um, so my progression in, in, in that process uh, wound up at the end. I, I said, you know, I'm prepared to stay here another 10 years if I have to, because I know we can lead a meaningful life. If I never get out of here, I think we can lead meaningful lives in this existence. 
Well, it didn't work out that way, so didn't have to do that. But um, I want to read another um, poem written quite a bit later after a lot of this, uh, which I think, if you'll note the, uh, the difference between the two, this is called Reflections on Captivity. How can I measure the loss of my dimensions as I lie spread across this crass expanse of time? Bitter years devoid of latitude or luster, my duty days of trial and decision are but pages turned, but pages not forgotten. Those countless hours of aimless retrospection, regret, restraint, and introspection, the strange monotony of unrewarded hopes, unconquered hopes amidst my unborn tears, have tempered the metal of my structure and filled the empty spaces of my soul. Well, what have we learned from all of this? Um, these are things that still guide my life today. So they were not just relevant then, but are now. And I think they're the most important things. Uh, the first is um, balanced activity. I tried to fill every day with mental, physical, and spiritual activity. And the physical included some relaxation, but uh, for the rest of it, uh, we exercised every day that we could. Uh, back in the 60s, you, some of you may remember isometrics in which you can exercise using one muscle against another. And we found that even if you were in leg irons and handcuffs, uh, you could still do isometrics and you could stay in shape and you could have physical activity. And if you were uh, not, then there were all kinds of things that you could do. You used to, in that little cell that you saw in Heartbreak Hotel, I could walk five miles a day if I wasn't locked down in the irons. Three steps in one direction and three steps back, back and forth, back and forth. But it was a dedication to stay in as, as good a shape mentally, physically, and spiritually as we could. And so that is something that's guided my life um, ever since. Well, the second is um, God's great gift to us of free will. And I think we all learned that the course of our lives, no matter where, or when, or what the circumstances are, is determined by the choices that we make. It's not by the circumstances. It's not by what you have or don't have. It is the choices that you make in regard to what your circumstances are. And I think back on that one decision that I made about Fred Cherry about worse place or a better place. You know, if I'd made a different choice, my life, I wouldn't be here today and my life would be entirely different because it would change the course of my life. And of course, we all make bad choices, but we still have the, we have the freedom to make those choices. And so I think that um, this, is, um, this has guided my life as well. And I have a, a thousand examples of choices that were made there that, that determined people's lives. I, there was a, a story, the, the first large group that I moved in with, there were nine of us. And of course, this gave us great opportunity for organization within one cell. We had a CO, an XO, ops boss, an education guy, a maintenance, and I think there was one guy left over for the men. But um, anyway, everybody had a job, and uh, there were all kinds of things that we could do then with this group of people, you know. We had a movie every night, and, and uh, we decided that um, we wanted to play cards, and of course we didn't have any cards, and the Vietnamese wouldn't give us any, uh, any uh, games or anything. We had no paper, pencil. We had paper, which toilet paper, but precious stuff. And so we sacrificed some of that and glued some up together with rice glue and cut it up into little cards like that and used uh, cigarette ashes and brick dust to make the, make the numbers and the suits. And, so we had a deck of cards, and some people played solitaire, and some people played poker, and um, I knew um, something about bridge. My mother had been a master player, and I'd played a lot in college, and so 
and I was the only one, and so uh, people wanted to play bridge, and we had nine people. One guy didn't want to play, but that was great because now we had two tables. We could play contract bridge and all of that, and so we were getting pretty good and so on. And we had a hiding place for these things, and uh, one day the door opened unexpectedly while we were, had them out, and we didn't get them hidden, and Vietnamese found them, and they came charging in, got all the head shed there, and uh, put us all in leg irons, and took the cards and tore them up in little pieces, and then burned them, and then threw them in the can, and you know, and and took half everything we had, and. Um, and then on the way out, they rub salt in the wound by saying, you are forbidden to play cards. Well, they just destroyed our cards. How were we going to do that? They took a toilet paper. We couldn't make any more cards. And then we decided to play cards without the cards. And so we played bridge, memory bridge, we call it. So having nine people was perfect. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. So one guy who didn't play became the dealer. And his job was to divide the deck up into four piles of 13 to memorize each pile. This took him a while. And then he had to teach each pile to a memory bank, the other four. And that took a while. And they had to memorize it. And they had to be sure they had it right. And then once that was done, then the players, the other four, could consult with their memory bank, the hand, and bid and play and whatever. Uh, and then the dealer became the, the umpire. You know, guy plays the ace of spades. I, you don't have that. No. <laughs> so um, this was laborious as hell. But it, it was an act of defiance because they told us we couldn't do it. And we did it anyway. And it made us feel empowered because we had made a choice that would never have occurred under any other circumstances. And so there's so many instances of this kind of thing happening that people made choices that just um, determined their lives. It, turned, it, it was amazing. And so that's the kind of thing that has stuck with me um, ever since. Well, I mentioned uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, if you haven't read Viktor Frankl, read it. He was uh, in Auschwitz in World War II. Um, he, he was a, a psychotherapist. He, wrote a book uh, about his experiences in, in Auschwitz and about his theory of psychotherapy, which is called logotherapy. And it really, he says man's most basic need is to discover the meaning in one's life. And if you are frustrated in that, you turn to other things that may not be as meaningful. Power, pleasure, all, all kinds of other things and you're in the end still frustrated because you haven't found a true meaning in your life. And so he used it th therapeutically. Uh, I had not read Frankel when I was there, but I certainly did afterwards, and it explained so much that we all search for a meaningful life through our professions and our families and our daily activities and everything. Um, and Frankel said, you know, you can you can discover the, this meaning um, by, by doing a deed or experiencing a value or through suffering. And he said suffering is the most powerful way. And so, and he said you can discover a meaningful life in the worst of circumstances. And I think there are many, many examples of that. Look at Helen Keller. Of course, she didn't do it by herself when we all need help in discovering this, so that's the, that, <laughs> that was a choice that, uh, that you make is to, is to, is how you face your suffering and what you learn from that. So three lessons are what I call important things. One is communications, because communications was central to everything that we did. Without it, we would have been isolated individuals, and that's exactly what the Vietnamese wanted. Because you know, as an isolated individual, you're much more susceptible to lies, to propaganda. If you have no one to count on for, for the truth or just to talk about it, you know, uh, there are probably people that could convince each of you 
as individuals over a long enough period of time that the world was flat. Simply because you don't have the resources to counter these very convincing uh, arguments about it. But of course, I would have no chance to convince this group of, of that. And so to divide and conquer was their modus. And so we knew that there was strength and unity. And so it was our communications that through most of this brought us together in a sense of unity. And the last prison that we were in um, after, uh, after the Sante raid that brought us all back into one place. And we called that Camp Unity because for the first time we were physically all there. Uh, but certainly we had been together through our communication um, all along. And uh, I, uh, after I was separated from Fred, Fred Cherry, I moved out to a really bad place out in the country, the Briar Patch, back into solitary confinement, almost, almost isolation. I could only um, tap on the wall with one, one guy. And the punishment, uh, they read out um, new punishment for communicating at all. And that was two days of heavy punishment, um, leg irons, handcuffs in a foxhole for 60 days with a cover on. You got out 10 minutes a day to use a bucket and eat one meal. So this was a graphic illustration of how important it was to the Vietnamese to keep us from simply tapping through the wall because that was that was endangered their program. So I could only tap to one guy, uh, Marine Corps Major F-4 pilot Howie Dunn. And I, we were in handcuffs behind our back all day. And so the only way I could tap was to back up to the wall and tap with the end of my finger very quietly because I sure didn't want to get in that foxhole. And uh, at first it was about how to, and this is when all the torture started, and so he's my only, only guy I could communicate with, and so we're talking about what happens and how do, what do we do next and uh, all of that. And, um, and then we began to talk about um, our careers, mine very short, his pretty long, much longer, and what our families were like and what we like to do, and we began to try and tell a joke every day uh, this is a grim period of time. And, um, and then we began to, to do all kinds of things, talk about baseball and sports and all, all kinds of things. And, and Howie and I got to be pretty good friends. Matter of fact, we had even uh, decided to torture ourselves and, and talk about food because it was, it was such an element of our lives at that time. And so um, we came up with this scheme that uh, one day it would be Howie's turn to come up with a menu for the day. So he would tap over what we were having for breakfast and, and then for lunch and dinner and cocktails and hors d'oeuvres and a whole schmear, you know. And then the next day it would be my turn to do the same. But, and then so in the evening where there were no lights there, it was pitch dark. Uh, so lying there, it gave me something to do, come up with something besides steak and potatoes you know, bacon and eggs for breakfast. And so uh, it gave us uh, something to do. Well, somewhere along there, I realized I had no idea what Howie Dunn looked like. I'd never seen him. We never saw any other prisoners at all because the, the shutters were always closed and you never got outside, never went anywhere except to interrogation. And so I asked him, I said, I tapped, I said, Howie, wh what do you look like anyway? He said, you know John Wayne? I said, yeah, I know John Wayne. He said, well, a lot like that. <laughs> oh, okay, so I took all that information that I had about Howie, and I put this mental image, you know, 6'2", broad shoulders, narrow hips, good looking guy, Marine, you know, fit. So um, I carried that information around with me for oh, another five years or so. There weren't too many Marines there, so I never ran into anybody who knew how he'd done. I told lots of stories about him. Um, and uh, uh, at the very end, when they're just getting ready to release us, they were in this big 
the big part of, of the Hanoi Hilton, which we call Camp Unity. And they did something they had never done before. They let a group of, we're in groups of about 40 out into this uh, courtyard. And then they opened the door to another cell and here comes another 40 people out. Some of them I had lived with, some I knew, uh, some I knew by sight and some I had never seen before. And this guy comes walking up to me and he is short and bald and not real good looking. And he stuck out his hand, he said, hi, I'm Howie Dunn. <laughs> I said, Howie, you son of a bitch, you, you lied to me. <laughs> He said, I know, but it was such great fun knowing <laughs> the image that you had of me all this time. <laughs> well, I loved Howie, and I love that story. Um, but the point of it is that in the instant he said, Howie Dunn, he went from being a complete stranger to being a, one of my best friends in all the world. Just because of numbers one to five. So that's the power of that communication. Uh, we have so many methods of communication today. I think we have too many. We have information overload. Our job is, is filtering out the garbage, getting the message through, letting the right information through. We had just the opposite problem in Vietnam. But the importance of communication today is uh, just as strong. It's how we build our families, our communities, our businesses, our professions. Everything depends on communication. Now, Stockdale was a senior naval officer there. Robbie Reisner was a senior officer for many years until uh, the, Na the Air Force uh, started flying some 06s. Um, and they were the overall SROs, but the operational SRO, senior ranking officer, was the most senior guy you could communicate with because there could not be any on-the-site leadership without the communications. And so that's why you had so many so-called junior officers were filling these leadership roles, you know, because they were the most senior within that little comm group, within a building. You know, and these were O threes and maybe O fours, but for the most part, they were the JOs. And you were operating on the guidance from from these heavy hitters, but they were they were hard to get in touch with, uh, even though we could sometimes. Um, so communication was was so important; it was the lifeblood of our whole existence. Well, the other thing I'm thinking about. Uh, was humor. Um, as I said, Howie and I tried to tell a joke every day, if we could. Um, you had to laugh at yourself, you know, um, your circumstances in order to make it better. Um, I had uh, some very interesting friends there. Uh, one guy from Louisiana. Anybody from Louisiana here? You probably know what a coon ass is then. And the rest of you can ask him what a coon ass is, but it's one of those Cajun Creole kind of things anyway, unusual guy. And one of the things Kunas would say when things got really bad, he'd say, just remember, it's always darkest before it's totally black. <laughs> just to put things in perspective, you know, and to interject a little humor. And my friend Irv Williams, uh, he said, well, you know, we bitching about something. He said, well, you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. The story, though, that I remember the most uh, was about my friend Mike Christian. Mike Christian was a former enlisted, uh, he was a A6 BN, and he was a little rough around the edges and a no-nonsense kind of guy, and Mike and I had a great friendship, and we did a lot of things together. I learned so much from Mike, and, but he, 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 I tended to try and be more of a diplomat, you know, don't, don't piss him off deliberately because you're going to get enough stuff normally. You don't want any extra. But a lot of people thought getting extra was a good deal, but I didn't. But um, he liked it that way. And uh, so he wound up with all the crappy little things they had to do and, and, and so on. But he, he's, that, was, that was his way of doing things, and that was fine. 
Um, we lived in this group of nine that I described where we played bridge. And uh, there was a, an escape that was planned from our compound, from our prison. And uh, we had participated in that by, uh, we went up in the overhead, um, uh, worked a barbed wire loose from the hole in the ceiling and could look over the wall and scope out the landscape there. And that's where these guys, two guys were gonna go on a rainy Saturday night it was pretty well planned about how they were gonna get out of the prison and so on, and we understood that it was pretty well planned as to what they were gonna do then. But unfortunately, um, they, they uh, uh, were caught. They went out on a rainy Saturday night and were caught early Sunday morning because they just stuck out you know, in Hanoi amidst uh, thousands and thousands of Vietnamese, and these were Americans, even though they had some, some disguises. Well, you can imagine the Vietnamese reaction to this. It was just uh, amazed. Uh, and they determined to find out everything that they possibly could about this uh, escape. And so they used a technique that they had used uh, to discover what was going on in the prison. We call it a comm purge, communication purge. And uh, what they would do is take one person from every cell block and they would put them in different rooms. They would ask them all the same questions uh, who's a senior guy? Um, how do you communicate? What o orders has he given? What are your escape plans and so on? Well, the first time that they, that they did that, they, they, they learned some things. Um, after that, we always had a cover story, okay? You can tell them what they already know. They know who's the senior guy. They know we tap on the walls, you know, all of this. You can tell them what they already know. And if everybody sticks to the same cover story, then they figure they've gotten to the truth, you know. Just like, you know, you're interrogating terrorists. You can't rely on what one terrorist tells you under ter interrogation. You, you, have to, you have to verify that with other sources. And so we figured, okay, if they verified it by everybody having the same answer, then um, they would stop thinking they had arrived at the truth. And then that way we could protect what was really important, which they didn't know. And that worked pretty well. But in this case, we had no cover stories. And so uh, they used that technique. And I remember about three o'clock in the morning, they, they, um, they came and opened the door and they pointed at Mike. They gave him the signal to roll up his stuff. We knew he was moving out and this was probably gonna be a comm purge. And um, I had two, I had two very powerful emotions in a short period of time. <clears throat> One was when they pointed at Mike, because I knew they were gonna point at somebody. And they pointed at Mike, and it was this huge sense of relief that it wasn't me, because I knew what lay, in, lay ahead for whoever it was. And then the second was when, when he was being led out, uh, he looked back at us and just kind of looked at us for a second. And it was a great sense of, of regret that it wasn't me, but that Mike was gonna go through this. And uh, anyway, it was just, it was a terrible time. We could hear these guys screaming in the night and this lasted for weeks. And we knew that they were extracting information from them because they'd come back and put us in leg irons or punish us for things that we had done in preparation for this uh, escape attempt and everything. And you remember in one of the pictures uh, it, that John introduced there was a method of torture called the rope trick. So we knew that they were using the things that they had used all along um, to get this information. And um, so um, finally it was over and uh, they came again and unlocked the door and pushed Mike inside with this little bundle of stuff and he had lost a lot of weight. He looked like hell. He really had been hammered. And uh, I know somebody, we all gathered around him and, and as soon as the door was closed, somebody said, Mike, where you been, what happened? And he looked up and with a little grin on his face said, oh, I got tied up and couldn't get away. <laughs> and uh, 
That changed everything. That changed everything. It just sent a message that I, I made it, I'm here. I'm, I'm not a victim, I'm not a hero. I just survived and I made it and we're gonna press on. And it changed the whole atmosphere. And I thought, my God, that is a powerful leadership trait. It's humor used at the right time. So I was convinced, you know, that humor is an essential part of leadership. And uh, it was what I think helped get us through some of the most difficult times. Well, the last thing is forgiveness. And um, at the very end, in spite of improved treatment over this last couple of years, we still had uh, retained the hatred that we felt for the Vietnamese, the people, for communism that enslaved them and others throughout the world. Um, and hatred, I think, had become a useful thing. It had become armor. Uh, it had become a shield against every attempt by the Vietnamese to convince us of, of the truth of what they were saying or the justness of their cause or um, it protected us from all of this. We hated them. We didn't believe anything they said unless it was verified. And we came up with a, you know, uh, a fudge factor. If they said they shot down 10 airplanes, we figured they got one, you know. So they exaggerated things by 10. And so this hatred was a useful thing. Well, at the very end, you know, we had been thinking a lot about the future. I had my list of 77 things and so on, but they didn't relate to the first few days that we were going to be home. And people start talking about, well, what are you going to be doing the first couple of days, you know, when you're, when you're home? And um, this, is, this is what I was thinking about. This is the first picture that I got of my wife and my, my baby. Uh, she's about five in this picture. Uh, she was five days old when I last saw her. So this is what I had been dreaming about and thinking about all that time. And that's what the first few days were going to be occupied with. Well, I heard these two guys sitting close by talking about what they were going to do to get back at the Vietnamese. In the first couple of days at their home, they're going to launch a program of revenge to get back at them for everything they had done for us. And I suddenly realized that this hatred had such a grip that that's, that was the choice that they were making. The first days of freedom to be spent that way. And I had made a vow that they were er never ever going to adversely affect my life again. And I realized that I couldn't carry that hatred with me if I was going to do that. And so when we finally marched out the gates of the Hanoi Hilton to get on the bus to go out to the airport, to get on the 141s to come home, I just turned around to that building and I said, I forgive you. And all of that hatred fell away. That armor fell away. And I walked out of two prisons that day. And so that act of freedom, that act of forgiveness was the most liberating thing I've done ever in my life. And it guides my life today. It, at the time, was not a Christian act. It was an act of self-preservation. And since then, I have, as a Christian, forgiven everyone uh, connected with that war. Well, except for two people. But I don't hate them. It's just that I cannot really bring myself to fully forgive them. But it doesn't interfere with my life at all, and so that's okay. Well, I, uh, I've done things in threes, but I have not read but two poems. So I'd like to close um, with one more, which is uh, coincidentally called The Three of Us. Yesterday on Meeting You, Hoping without knowing you, <clears throat> knowing without asking you, loving without telling you. The young and misty two of us, sharing each the best of us, accepting two the worst of us, and we so good for both of us. And as for me, the faulty one, 
the wild and hungry, needy one, to spend my life in search of one and finding you the perfect one. And so we shared our pastel days, our soft and glowing magic days, and you a child within those days, and then our few but perfect days. Now two of you to wait for me, to love, to hope, to pray for me, and I still feel you, part of me, though you and she so far from me. The future is still so bright for us, for you, for me, for three of us, and she, the best of each of us, will fill the lives of both of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hatton, Hatton <laughs> you get me every answer. time you do that last poem, Porter. <laughs> uh, Dr. Halliburton has agreed to take a few questions for us. So what we'd like to do is ask you if you have a question to come forward to these two microphones, not to the ones at your seat. So uh, does anyone have a first question? Please uh, come to the microphone. And if not, I'll kick one off. Uh, and second, I'll let the Admiral kick one off. <laughs> I just want to, man, I'm losing my voice. Thank you. Uh, two years at SWAST, you are our best speaker. And now two years at the college, uh, you remain. Thank you very much. I can't resist, though. 77 files, art, aviation, automobiles. So what's your favorite work of art, your favorite aircraft, and your favorite <laughs> car? <laughs> well, my favorite aircraft was the uh, F-4, even though it uh, let me down uh, one time. <laughs> um, but it did have a Martin Baker seat. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I survived because of uh, the grace of God, the Martin Baker seat, and the, whoever the guy was that packed my parachute. So I have, um, it was really my only experience uh, in aviation. And so the F4 is uh, my favorite. Uh, <clears throat> my favorite automobile is a is a forty Ford Deluxe Business Coupe. Older than I am. <laughs> uh, I've never had one, but I always dream about it. And uh, someday maybe I I will. But uh, that that would be my favorite automobile. Favorite work of art. That's very difficult. Um, I would say Michelangelo's David, perhaps most magnificent. Um, but there are so many, and I think art, you know, has always inspired my life. And um, uh, we see we see so many different things that we would never see if we were not looking through the artist's eyes. And so it's hard to say what the favorite what the favorite is. Uh, but I would say David, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Commander Matt Lovering, uh, United States Navy. I went to the University of Minnesota, and Captain Arvin Chauncey was one of our uh, COs. And oh, he's, who was his name? Arvin Chauncey. Oh, Chauncey, yeah. Yeah, he's, um, for those of you who don't know, he, he spent just under seven years in captivity, and he would come to the campus every year and give a brief, and he would explain many funny stories like you, but one of the things that bothered him the most was what he felt was betrayed trust by... America, either through media stories or visits, or that would let out secrets like what the finger actually meant. Did that did that affect your experience also? And if so, how did you overcome it? I think it did. It had um, it had a, a a great effect because I know that I and a lot of us there, um, if you're being pressured to to make a statement that is almost identical to to what some senator or congressman is saying uh, in Congress about the war. And yet we were, <laughs> you know, they were, they were pressuring us to make the same kind of statement. Um, I think it was very disappointing to know that fellow Americans uh, would side with the enemy uh, for whatever reason. 
you know, I think we understood that there were some people who were conscientious objectors. There were some people that just refused to go, um, that, um, you know, paid the price, and there were others who were cowardly left the country, um, you know, or punctured their eardrums or any other ruse to get out of serving and so on. And I think that was a great, great disappointment that Americans would behave that way and so on. Um, of course, the most egregious was, was Jane Fonda's visit there. She's one of the ones that I can't really forgive. Um, and so, yeah, it had an effect. And so we knew uh, the effect that, that any statements that we might make, you know, uh, denouncing the war, and we as credible spokesmen, you know, that, that we had to avoid that at all costs, you know, because that would further, uh, further their objective to build this anti-war movement, for example. But it was so clear to us that that was how they were going to win the war, that militarily they were never going to beat us, as all of you know, they never won a, a major battle. Um, but to them, that was irrelevant. You know, that they, if they could hang on long enough, they would wear down the American public support. They knew our center of gravity, and it was our support for the war. And it worked. And so it was so disappointing, and so, no, more than disappointing, uh, that Americans seem to be on the other side of that, you know, that they were lengthening the war, that they were, they thought they were helping to end the war when in fact they were not, they were lengthening the war. That answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Porter, most of the uh, people that you were uh, fellow prisoners were officers. But I think we have at least one case in Doug Hagdahl, who was an enlisted mm -hmm. uh, member. Can you tell me what his experience was as a prisoner and how he did? Right. Um, well, Doug, Doug was a, um, he was an enlisted guy. I think he was 19 years old. He was on the cruiser Canberra and uh, somehow fell off at night, uh, whether he was sleeping or, or what. I don't, I don't know. The, the, there's some mystery about that. But he wound up in the water and... Nobody knew he was there, so the Canberra steams away, and he floats around out there until some Vietnamese fishermen pick him up, and they turn him over to the military, and the military brings him to Hanoi. And of course, he's, <clears throat> he's not really part of our group because our group was really like the, the German system, a Stalag, there were Stalags, and then there was Stalag Luft, which was for air, people that fell out of the air. And so we were in essentially a Stalag Luft, and uh, Doug was not. And so, but he, he wound up there, and uh, they figured they would use him for propaganda. Uh, he, he tried to convince them that he was just this dumb, uneducated 19 year old seaman that didn't know anything. And um, they happened to put him in with a, another Navy guy named Dick Stratton, who was up here in Newport for many years. And, um, Dick was a controversial type, but he was a great leader, I thought, and uh, he lived with, uh, with, with Doug, and he taught him uh, all these member the memorization of the names. At that time, there were about 250, 250 names, and so he taught Doug all these 250 names. Um, he discovered that Doug had this amazing memory. When he got there, he could recite the Gettysburg Address, forward and backwards. So he had that kind of almost photographic memory. And so Dick uh, pumped him full of every scrap of information about what was going on in the prisons because um, Doug had never been tortured or really mistreated um, and they were going to, to release him early. And the first time they, they asked him if he wanted to go home early, he said, no, <laughs> I'm going to stay here with everybody else. I'm not going home early. And uh, so he missed the first group of three. There were 12 total that chose to come home early. Um, Dick Stratton ordered him to accept this early release simply because the information that he had and Doug reluctantly accepted that order. 
and was released early in the second group. And Doug Hedgel, because of the knowledge that he had, first of all, there were detailed information about the methods of torture, about the methods of resistance, about the methods of communication, about organization, about everything that was going on. And this is the first intelligence that came out of Vietnam about what things were really like. Plus he had 250 names. Now, uh, he rattled off these names. 15 minutes after he landed in the United States, he was on the phone to my wife saying, your husband is alive and is okay. And that was the first confirmation she had had other than simply my name had gotten out. There's an interesting story behind that, if I have time. You do. Um, my wife thought I was dead for a year and a half. And so she's living in Atlanta. And uh, all of a sudden she gets a call from somebody in the Navy or State Department asking some questions, you know, how are you doing? You gotten remarried? <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> Can we come by and see you? <laughs> she says yes. And so about six people arrive and, and uh, they are very nervous and everything. And she just out of the blue said, just relax. I know you're here to tell me that my husband's alive. So they said, well, that's right. <laughs> um, but all they had was a, a name that had gotten out and uh, they couldn't tell her how or anything. And so uh, she and... Uh, the wife of my pilot who was killed had become very good friends and they used to go to Washington um, regularly and Marty was um, head of the 10 southern states and the, for the National League and so they went to Washington. So they went up there one time and they met with, I don't know, Haig I think was at the time and were asking, how is it you know that Porter is alive and Stan is not? Because his status was still KIA. And um, so they take, they take her one way and Marty the other way and they go into a room and there are about six guys there and this guy has a briefing book and they're explaining to her that they can't tell her because of the source. And one by one, these guys got to go to the bathroom, make a phone call, whatever, leave. And so they leave her with the briefing book and she's a smart girl and so she figured out <laughs> supposed to read this. So she did and she reads this report which a lot of it was blanked out, but it essentially said there was an intelligence source, you know, a Vietnamese spy who had brought my name out, and that was it, the only name. So that was what she believed. <clears throat> That's what I believed when I came home and I said, how, did you, how were you first told I was alive? And so she told me that story, and I said, okay, but that sounds a little funny. You know, Vietnamese spy, why would he just send out my name and all of that? So anyway, some of you have read uh, Jim Stockdale's book in Love and War, Jim and Sybil Stockdale's book in Love and War. And I had read that and I had, uh, I was actually irritated at CAG um, because he had revealed this, I thought, brilliant way of communicating that uh, Sybil and her Keiko had come up with, the Intel guy. And it was this, in, this um, invisible carbon paper and so CAG gets a, he gets a letter. He was one who was allowed to write because of his notoriety and they wanted to give the impression that everybody was writing when it was just, you know, a very small percentage of people who were. And so um, he gets a letter, it's got a picture in it and the letter says, uh, here I've sent you a picture of your aunt Margaret. Um, we took her to the beach recently because uh, she loves water. He didn't have an Aunt Margaret and uh, didn't know who this person was. And so he, being a bright guy as well, figured out the two and soaked the picture in water. And it came apart, and inside were two pieces of paper. One of them was a very small little list of instructions, and the other was this invisible ink carbon paper. And so the instructions were, and they knew at the time that the guys who were writing were writing on a full-size piece of paper. Uh, when we started writing, many years later, it was on this little six-line kind of postcard thing. 
Uh, and so they, um, to avoid the appearance of censorship of our mail, they only allowed that you'd write a rough draft and you could only talk about family and health or whatever. And they would censor out what they wanted and then you wrote a smooth draft. So fortunately, um, he wrote his rough draft and they came back and had censored it and so he was gonna write a smooth draft and he put the, paper, the, the carbon paper over the written part and can now write a clandestine message and the part that I had missed when I first read this was what he put in that clandestine message. And it was the first 40 names of POWs that were there. Guess who was number 40? So CAG, um, Stockdale was the spy. And he didn't really realize that, I guess, that the impact that that had on three of us because when when I, they announced that I was alive, it was with two others, uh, Rob Doremus and um, Bill Frank. And they had been declared killed as well. And so the three of us were on that list. Both of them shot down before I was. So anyway, that, that's my spy story. Yes, ma'am. Lieutenant Commander Laughlin, did you read Clausewitz in German? And who is your favorite theorist on war? <laughs> I did not read um, Clausewitz in German. <laughs> uh, my German was strictly conversational um, and not very good at that. But uh, <clears throat> my favorite theorist is Clausewitz. I mean, I, Clausewitz, uh, I think, is the central theorist even today. Am I not right? I mean, he was so perceptive about everything. Uh, the conditions changed, obviously, but Clausewitz still nailed it about the relationship of strategy and policy, about uh, things that can go wrong, about friction, about everything. So Clausewitz, uh, uh, as a general theorist of war, understanding the nature of war, I, I don't think anybody has equal that. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. Colonel Johnson, United States Marine Corps. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I found you. it very inspiring. I think most everyone here did. Um, quick question, did you read or have you read uh, Unbroken? I have. And have you had a chance to meet uh, Lou Zamperini and what were your thoughts about I have, I have about not him? had a chance to meet him. I would love to meet him. I, I have great, great admiration for him. I, even discounting his um, prison experience, 47 days at sea eating sharks and stuff. <laughs> that was pretty incredible. No, he was an amazing, amazing guy. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Commander Drew McGinley, United States Navy. Uh, you spoke a bit about uh, the necessity of humor, uh, just in leadership in general, and uh, uh, certainly in difficult, uh, dif difficult circumstances. Uh, I was wondering if you could provide any examples, uh, if you have any jokes, maybe about uh, Jane Fonda or one of your other favorite <laughs> targets. <laughs> Most, uh, most prison humor is not repeatable in <laughs> <laughs> No, there was, there was one, uh, you know, we, we sat over there and we knew that our families were getting our paychecks and all of this. And um, so the, the kind of the description was, um, what, what wears a fur coat, drives a Cadillac convertible and weighs 300 pounds? A POW's wife. <laughs> Fortunately, that turned out not to be true. <laughs> uh, probably the last question, Porter. Uh, can you explain how you came to have a, a gravestone uh, where it is today, and how do you feel about it? Well, you know, I, um, I went back to my hometown of Davidson, North Carolina, where I grew up, and uh, they had a big celebration. They blocked off the street, had a keg of beer, first time. You know. um, and uh, as I was greeting, or people were greeting me, uh, an old family friend came up, and he had been the director of the funeral home. And um, so we chat for a minute, and he said, by the way, I have something of yours. I said, oh, what's that? And he said, your, your gravestone. Gravestone. Well, um, 
while I was gone, my mother died, my grandparents died, that I had grown up with these three people. And uh, they had been buried in the family plot. And my mother, unbeknownst to me, obviously, had commissioned this and had put it in our family plot. And then when she died and my grandparents died, and by that time they knew I was alive, and so they, he took the tombstone up and kept it in his garage. And he's now asking me what I want to do with it. I said, well, you know, I haven't given that a lot of thought. <laughs> but, but I do have, the Navy owes me a shipment from North Carolina, and so I'll, I'll have the movers come by and, and pick it up. And we were living in Atlanta at the time, and, uh, and so they did. And uh, I can remember when they delivered this thing, they delivered this load of stuff, and about nine o'clock one morning, a van pulls up, and I'm in the shower, and my wife goes down, and, and she said, you better come down here and, and deal with these guys. I think they're drunk. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I walked out, and they saw me. Their eyes got really big, and they says, is you the one that's on this dome? <laughs> They didn't want anything to do with that thing. You know? <laughs> anyway, so we had them haul it back in the back, and it sat in the woods for a while, and then we moved it down by the garden, and then, you know, we moved up here, and I lugged it up here, and it stayed in storage for a while, and then I built a grape arbor in front of the croquet court, and we put it there, and great sense of, great conversation piece, you know, in a cocktail party. <laughs> Nothing else worked. Go out and look at the stone, you know. <laughs> so I've dragged it back to North Carolina, and it sits, in, sits at home in, in Greensboro. And I think I've figured out, you know, what the hell's going to happen when I really die? I mean, there's going to be some confusion here, right? So I think I know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to will it to uh, the uh, main maritime, main, mili main military museum up in, uh, up in Maine. And this is uh, something that was started by an Air Force guy um, who uh, started collecting POW bracelets and then people began giving him other stuff and it just ballooned into this huge project. And so I figured that that, and I've given him a lot of artifacts uh, in addition to the ones that uh, are over here in the museum. And so I think that's the appropriate place for it, with a plaque of explanation. <laughs> yes, sir. Porter, thank you very much for your presentation, and thanks for your service to the United States. Thank you.